cruise ships, a symbol of mass tourism. They bring in tourists and cash. But over-tourism also creates many problems. The pandemic was a respite for overrun cities and villages, but it also caused huge economic problems for those depending on tourism. Is there a middle way? How to balance sustainable and profitable tourism? That's a big question. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones. Good to have you with us. Solitude and peace and quiet in the countryside. The pandemic made that kind of holiday very appealing. Even Croatia, a beach destination for sun worshippers across Europe, is now showing a new face, greener and relaxing. You can see four countries from this hill in Croatia. Austria, Slovenia, Hungary and Slovakia. All of these countries are fighting for tourists at the moment, as is Croatia. In 2012, when Nina Novincic bought an old, dilapidated house to fix up, no one guessed that tourism would play such an important role here. We can't offer our guests sun and sea, so we have to offer other things. We have to offer quality, think of new ideas and constantly improve and expand so that we can attract guests. In 2019, Croatia recorded a record high of 21 million tourists. In 2020, the year of the pandemic, the numbers of typical tourists collapsed. But for Nina and her husband Slatko, there was a bright side. We had more to do last year than ever before. The wine region in the north of Croatia suddenly became an attraction. We offer our guests security, privacy and closeness to nature. An idyllic green spot just for themselves. That's what their guests were looking for in the pandemic. It's quite common for people to come here on the way back from the coast to recover. To recover from the chaos, from everything that they experience down there, from the noise and throngs of people. Another advantage, agro-tourism works all year round, not just in summer. I hope that this trend will last and we shouldn't forget that tourism actually causes a lot of problems. We tended to forget that before the coronavirus crisis. In many places, tourism destroyed the exact thing that made the destination so popular in the first place. Many people in Croatia lost their jobs in the tourism industry due to the coronavirus. But the crisis also inspired new reflections. To relax and recover, you don't always need a beachside resort. Sometimes you need just the opposite. Let's bring in Irina Atelievich from the Institute of Tourism in Zagreb, a public institute in Croatia specializing in research and consultancy services in tourism, and Claudia Dolezal, a professor at the Department of Business at IMC University Krems. Her research focuses on tourism in Southeast Asia, and it's good to have both of you on the program. Irina, peace and solitude, that's what holidaymakers were seeking during the pandemic, also in Croatia. Do you think that this trend will last or will people eventually fall back into old habits? I think that uh, pandemic definitely serves as a, a tipping point to, for travelers to finally commit to their own sustainable journey as actually the latest booking.com research uh, get it from more than 29,000 travelers across 30 countries shows that with 72% uh, of global travelers believe uh, people have to act now to save the planet for future generations. They are more than ever committed to do so in a mindful way, to travel uh, and stating that the pandemic has influenced them to want to travel more sustainably in the future and almost half admitting that the pandemic has shifted their attitude to make positive changes in their everyday lives. Mm. Is that something that you also observe in uh, Southeast Asia, Claudia? We know that uh, the pandemic uh, hit the region hard. Some 34 million people there lost the job last year. Uh, how, how can they adapt to an eventual new form of tourism? 
Yeah, um, as you say, the region has really been hit very hard by tourism and it's highly dependent on tourism, as we know. And uh, people have lost their livelihoods, even left the sector altogether. Uh, but slowly the situation is improving and countries are opening up, uh, such as uh, in Thailand with the Sandbox project in Phuket, a very interesting development happening here, which is a development where we're isolating tourists again in their tourist bubbles in resorts, uh, a kind of mass tourism that has been criticized in the past. And here in this region, we're also seeing uh, digital nomads being targeted quite strongly to stay for a few months or even years. And uh, we have to consider these are very diff different tourists. Um, they might not be in the most way? responsible ones. Yeah. In, in what way are they different? Uh, they are different because uh, they obviously have different needs. Uh, they are staying much longer, they are working, they are not the traditional tourists we're seeing and they are definitely very different from other tourists that are being targeted like uh, domestic tourists or the high quality tourists that uh, Thailand is trying to target rather than the backpacker that actually gives uh, more uh, money to local communities and the rural uh, countryside and the homestays. Yeah, uh, I think we really have to think about uh, sustainability here and uh, we have to also be realistic that Southeast Asia is a region that can't just target the wealthy traveler but also must uh, target those uh, backpackers they have done before. Right. So, so uh, when we take this uh, lesson learned, if you like, back to Europe, Irina, what lessons can be learned from this pandemic, both for, for the tourists and for the people whose livelihood depends on tourism? What kind of tourism will be sustainable? Tourism that is more localized, more regenerated, that connects to local community, to the nature, that regenerates places and resources on the basis of which tourism actually depends. And this is the trend that we see now from more conscious travelers who, um, experiencing the isolation of pandemic, realize how much they miss the nature, how much they really uh, need healthy food and healthy lifestyle, indeed more peace and the solitude. And this is an uh, excellent opportunity for tourism to totally reset what they say to rebuild back better and to become more socially and environmentally sustainable. And in Europe, we have this uh, incredible opportunity for the fact that we are the, the key uh, global market and it can become a much more localized and regionalized that it can contribute to more sustainable um, future, not only of tourism, but um, of uh, our economies and the planet. Uh, Claudia, would that work for Southeast Asia as well? Yeah, I do believe so. And uh, definitely sustainable tourism is the only option forward here in this in this region. We need innovative ideas now. We need to move away from this dependency tourism has created that actually towards actually diversifying economies more and creating linkages. Uh, but again, this crisis has shown us the huge inequalities that we see in, in the world in terms of privilege to travel and health system and access to government funding. So unfortunately, it's developing countries that have been hit hardest. But I also think there is a new energy here and innovative ideas that can be mm -hmm. used to actually make tourism better. All right, Dr. Irina Atelievich from the Institute of Tourism in Zagreb and Claudia Dolezal from ICM University Krems in Austria. Thank you so much for your time. And time now for one of your questions. And it's over again to our science correspondent, Derek Williams. Can we prevent future variants from arising with restrictions, vaccinations and lockdowns? Like other pathogens, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19 is constantly mutating, which is a natural process of genetic change uh, that's as old as evolution itself. Uh, mutation gives rise to new variants, and the vast majority of them are less competitive than the variants now circulating widely, but a few could prove to be more competitive, whether in terms of transmissibility, like Delta, or potentially in terms of, for instance, immune escape. Um, to some extent, therefore, it's a numbers game. Every time someone is infected, it means the evolutionary wheel of fortune starts to spin, and the chances grow a little more likely that the wheel will eventually land on a variant that would be harder to fight than the variants that we currently face. But the reverse is also true. Every time that we prevent an infection through the measures that we take, it does a little bit 
to limit the opportunities the virus has to evolve. And, and that's a vital long-term aspect of measures like restrictions and vaccinations and lockdowns that's, that's often forgotten, I think. Of course, we take all of those measures to protect ourselves and, and also to try to prevent others from getting a disease that could cripple or even kill us. But by limiting the spread of SARS-CoV-2, we're also helping to slow the pace of evolution in the virus, since how quickly potentially dangerous variants arise is directly linked to how many opportunities that the virus has to replicate. So, so while we can't necessarily prevent future dangerous variants from arising with prevention and mitigation measures entirely, um, they do help us to reduce the chances that the evolutionary wheel of fortune might land on one. 